want to talk about deconstructing narratives. Here's a narrative um, we can deconstruct quickly. How about the Indian genocide narrative? You know, they always say that white colonialist oppressors genocided the Indians and took their land. So that is a pretty succinct uh, demonstration of some of the main techniques of postmodern deception. So they have framing. That's the, one of the first techniques, and that's basically like cherry picking or, or you know, picking the, the, the picture that you want to look at by setting the frame or choosing the frame around it. So if you say that white colonialists genocided Native Americans, um, you're kind of dropping the context, which is that everybody has been fighting everybody since forever. So like Indians were fighting Indians, whites were fighting whites, um, Muslims were fighting whites, Muslims were fighting Muslims, Chinese were fighting Mongols, Mongols were fighting Europeans. You know, everybody's been fighting everybody since forever. So if you're just focusing in on whites genociding native Indians and kind of implying that that's something exceptional or unique in the history of the world, um, that's an example of framing. And then, um, well, it's also you know, a lie by loading. omission. Yeah, it's a lie by omission. And then there's loading, which is, uh, adding the, the moral and emotional content, right? So words like colonialist have moral and emotional content built in. Um, colonialist or colonizer colonist might not have as much so really it depends on which word you're using and sometimes even very similar words have you know very different ladings so colonizer or colonialist would be pretty negative colonist not so negative although it's it's picking up some by association with those other terms um Genocide, it's another loaded term, obviously. Now, we could nitpick that because it's not actually known how many Native Indians there were in North America when Europeans showed up. Um, it is pretty certain that some of the highest estimates, which range up to like 20 million, are pretty implausible. So, uh, you know, there's 20 million people in Australia, 25 million. And if you landed anywhere along the coast of Australia, almost, or at least anywhere inhabitable, it would be slam packed full of people. So it's pretty obvious that North America was not that densely populated um, as those high estimates. When people landed, European people, they normally didn't encounter native Indians right away. You know, they'd normally have to explore a bit to find some. And they didn't really have permanent settlements. They kind of rotated around different territories that they claimed. And they also had a fundamentally different system of property norms. So they certainly claimed territories. They didn't really claim property. And that's why Europeans could set up farms. And at first, it wasn't really that big a source of conflict because that wasn't taking up much room and the Indians could just, oh, sorry. And the Indians could just kind of, um, you know, go around them basically because they had hunting ranges and whatnot. And so, uh, if a little bit of that hunting range got used up by farms, it wasn't a big deal. It's like if an anthill shows up on your farm, it's not that big a deal, right? Cause you can work around it. If it starts to show up in your yard, that might be a bigger deal and maybe you're gonna take more action against it. Um, but if you just have a, an anthill out in your back 40, you're not even gonna worry about it because it doesn't conflict with your usage of that territory for the most part. So at first, there wasn't much of a conflict between those property norms. Eventually, there was more of a conflict once the European settlers got more numerous and that conflict you know, 
became a series of fairly large scale wars uh, in the course of which something like 50,000 Indians were killed according to the US Census Bureau and 20,000 European settlers. So the violence went both ways um, and it definitely wasn't a one-sided thing. And if you're talking about the scale of it, 50,000 out of possibly, let's say 2 million native Indians who were in North America when the Europeans arrived, that doesn't really rise to the scale of a genocide at least that portion of it. Now we do know that, or we think that their numbers went down because, you know, let's say 2 million is a plausible estimate for how many there were. And we know that it went down to 500,000 by the end of the 19th century. So three quarters of them, but we don't know what the losses were due to. We think about 50,000 of them were violent deaths over the course of, you know, two centuries. Of course, there's also um, a large portion that died to disease. We just, uh, we, I, don't, I don't know if we know exactly how many. We don't know how many exactly died of disease. We don't know how many died to, um, you know, let's say loss of territory and loss of resources um, from loss of territory. Uh, we don't know how many simply intermarried with the white population. We don't know whether there was a natural decrease because over 200 years, you know, a natural decrease generation over generation, it's not hard to get, you know, three quarters reduction, say, in population over 200 years. Um, so we don't know exactly what all the causes were. Calling the, the violent conflict portion a genocide seems to be a wild exaggeration because we're, some, we're talking about a few tens of thousands of deaths over a few centuries. Yeah. So relatively small scale. Yep. And this is a really good example of uh, one of these narratives that we have out in the culture that's been there for a long time that uh, it's framed in one particular direction. It's not examined from all sides. It's accepted as gospel and it's taught to multiple generations as such. And there's no pushback really against this narrative uh, at, at this point. I mean, there is from from us and from a lot of other people who know that it's um, uh, an unfair biased perspective on history, but um, it's, it's already dominated um, the mindset of so many people, which is the big oh, part of the problem. And that's the other part is the last part is the overloading, right? Cause it's pervasive. It's everywhere, right? You see it in movies, you see it on TV, you see it, you hear it in the news, you hear it in school, you read it in books, right? It's just everywhere you look. It was in the, uh, it was in the Sopranos. The SJWs won that uh, Columbus Day is a genocide parade against the mafia. It was, what, the early 2000s or the late 90s? Some fucking balls bad mouth in America, especially now. I thought the Columbus was the hero of America. Oh, see, it's these Indians and the commie fucks. They want to paint Columbus as a slave trader instead of an explorer. So, yeah, been pervasive for a while. Yep. And uh, that's a big part of the challenge we have is trying to uh, trying to take these narratives that are already planted in the culture in the minds of multiple generations and trying to work these back, um, add all the necessary nuance to them and add, you know, add some real perspective. I mean, people it, it one of the things that amazes me is that people don't have any gratitude or they seem to not have any gratitude, you know, for. Um, for the the civilization that we live in and, and everything that we do actually have now. I mean, it, it's like the irony of sitting inside of a Starbucks cafe, si sipping on a latte, you know, on a, you know, high tech supercomputer complaining about the civilization that brought you all those things in the first place. Like the irony of all that is lost on these people and it never ceases to amaze me. You can't have yeah. a civilization without uh, the what the, the definition for property. They didn't have and hold territory in a, in a fashion that looked like property. They moved around and pulled resources as they could and moved their tribes around until you have a basis for a civilization. Your claims to a place are only as good as whoever can be the most violent. Right of conquest. And 
you know, the Indians did a pretty successful job of defending themselves against the Vikings around the year 1000. So the Vikings showed up and they were technologically superior, obviously, because they had metal and all these other things that the Indians didn't have. But um, the Indians were able to make it uneconomical for them to live there and to set up a permanent settlement. Um, yeah. So they responded pretty immediately and pretty forcefully. Now that might've been a reflection of how the Vikings behaved, <laughs> um, but, but they responded pretty forcefully and pretty immediately and they expelled more or less expelled the Viking invaders, never actually like vanquished them per se, but just made it too much trouble to be there. Um, and obviously that didn't happen with successive waves of exploration or colonization. It, it might've happened in part, but, um, you know, several of them were able to take, take hold and get established. And once they did, I mean, then it's just, um, deterministic basically because resources go to whoever is willing and able to pay the most for them. And whether that's in money in a market or in violence and conflict, um, you know, that's going to tend to be whoever can put them to the most productive use and a settled densely populated technologically advanced civilization can put land and resources to more productive uses than a sparse lower tech semi nomadic um culture i'm uh i'm actually reminded of, of three points here uh one uh, of a money python is like what what have the romans ever done for us and what have they ever given us in return the aqueduct and the uh, second is reframing. Um, it's not it's not important to um, disprove a prevailing narrative as much as it is to reframe it. Um, I'm so, <laughs> of course, it decides to beep right now. Uh, for example, um, the idea of um, Native Americans going through genocide at the hand of European invaders, um, that's a narrative designed to induce guilt. And it was ran rampantly through public education in my time, I mean, 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> the training didn't really work on me. Uh, what ended up happening instead was while the rest of my team, while the rest of my uh, classmates were sitting there crying about the, the plight that the Indians went through, uh, my, my response was to say, holy crap, if you don't get your technology and your civilization in order, you're probably going to lose it. Now, now, that was not the desired outcome. That was not supposed to be the takeaway of that type of narrative, but that was a reframing. So instead of me uh, taking offense to the idea that I should be made to feel guilty about something that happened in the past, instead, um, by promoting this different frame that, hey, civilization matters and you can lose it. Um, suddenly, what you're doing is you're shifting outside of that control space that that entire conversation is trying to steer everyone into anyways. And, and furthermore, uh, a lot of the Indian tribes, uh, their native tongues and their, the names for each other that they would give one another would basically translate to that asshole over there who keeps raping me. I'm just gonna take a little look. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? I mean you no harm. I mean you no harm. Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. Don't you run for me, you little shit. So, I mean, the, reframing is an important part of, of this conversation and, and worth exploring as well. Yeah, definitely. It's it's really this reminds me how um how much this narrative has sunk into our culture. The the guilt um has been so pervasive that it's really in a big way led to um the allowance of a lot of these uh issues that we have uh in the culture today where, you know, mobs are running rampant and uh people are allowed to get away with things that uh you know, 100 years ago they would never have been able to get away with. You know, and speaking of this thing being around to instill guilt, you know, these kind of narratives have two purposes, basically. And the first is to put us on the defensive. And the second is to instill um, self-doubt or self-loathing, even in, in particularly weak-minded individuals, so that we don't actually defend ourselves or defend ourselves very effectively. So if we're on the defensive, we don't have the initiative. If we're reacting to accusations and demands, 
you know, we're playing somebody else's game. And that's the point of these narratives is to keep us on the defensive, to keep us on the back foot so that we're not seizing the initiative so that they can take the initiative so that they can press their agendas. But you've got your parties muddled up. There's no pussy here. Just a dose that'll make you wish you were born a woman. And then secondarily to demoralize us so that uh, we don't resist that very effectively. And if you find fancy gentlemen ain't gonna do nothing about it, then you're just a bunch of lousy, yellow, stinking cowards. The, the whole bunch of you. Yep. Um, like the uh, Yuri Bezmenov uh, interview, uh, the first step in the whole Soviet agenda in, in terms of it getting into a particular culture is uh, demor demoralization. And uh, we've, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's already complete in the West. Um, so we'll see if it gets to play out its entire cycle of, uh, you know, going through to crisis and then normalization of the uh, new totalitarian state. Um, hopefully not, but you know, we're on that track right now. Now, that would be an interesting thing to discuss because you just mentioned Yuri Bizmenov, and that's a uh, um, KGB defector who um, recorded a series of interviews back around 1984, I believe, where he was talking about KGB subversion. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. And how they spend 85% of their budget, not on you know, espionage or spy stuff like in the movies per se, but just on propaganda and subversion and agitation and, and that kind of stuff. And um, he basically described what's going on today with like the social justice uprisings and all the stuff about equality and different kinds of, uh, you know, deviant groups or, or marginalized groups or, or, you know, foreign groups that all have their little agendas and their demands and, and everything. And um, so obviously that was going on then, it's going on now. The KGB doesn't exist anymore. So an interesting question would be, like that program still seems to be very much in existence. Whose ownership did it pass into? Whose ownership didn't it pass into? It's practically privatized at this point. Um, all the lessons that were learned that the KGB were doing even since before the KGB, back in like the 1920s, at the dawn of, uh, of Soviet Russia, um, the very first thing they did was take all of those techniques and then run them into China. So the, the Kai-shek government, the nationalist government that was there, the Russians were just running rampant in Chinese uh, academies, especially those with very close French ties. Um, you had a lot of the Kai-shek nationalist intelligence apparatus that was deeply sympathetic to, to Russian communism at that time. So Mao, was, Mao Zedong was not a very good military leader. Um, it was just that uh, his opposition's intelligence was completely undermined by these demoralization tactics, so much so that Kai-shek could not operate meaningfully against Mao and the rest of the, um, um, the communists as well. Uh, so these types of tactics work. Um, the Russians didn't start on us, or I should say the Soviets didn't start on us. They, they actually started on China, um, and then they, they started transferring them here, and then the rest of the Cold War. So it's... Um, They've gotten very good over the past century, these techniques. They've been iterating them openly. Other countries have been improving upon them. Google has privatized a lot of it. So it's once you've unleashed this genie, it, it's very difficult to put back in the bottle. Now, I know the CIA um, got you know, their hands dirty with some of that as well. Like I heard they were funding Miss Magazine and a lot of the feminist movement um, at the behest of, I guess, corporate interests to try and get women into the workforce. And they were also funding a lot of modern art. 
and architecture. And this was apparently, now this is all hearsay. I'm just repeating what I've heard from random sources. I can't authenticate any of this, but apparently they were supporting a lot of the mar uh, modern art and architecture as kind of like a reverse subversion against the Soviet Union to say like, hey, you can't subvert us because we're going to subvert ourselves kind of thing. Like, look, look how grotesque we're willing to make our country without you. Your country. Your country, officer. Yes, my country. And <laughs> <laughs> so fuck you <laughs> yeah you know it's it's interesting how all these um all these ideas have become so pervasive and uh it's it's a little bit different i mean you know what what happened in the soviet union um with with their communist revolution and you know they they didn't have exactly the problems we have now but in terms of how the ideology is playing out it's similar um, like I, I wanted to bring up something, uh, Brian, that, that we had discussed earlier on your timeline, um, um, the, the diversity density index that you had overlaid with the murders with guns. Um, and the audience isn't going to see this on the screen, but you know, we have different problems here, but we have the same, um, you know, we, we've got, we've got the ideology or the narrative of diversity, you know, diversity is our strength and that's crept into everything in multiple generations. And it's, 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 um, it's undeniable as a mainstream uh, good, you know, as far as the mainstream media and the universities are concerned, you know, diversity is our strength. Um, yet, if you look at the empirical data, it uh, paints a very different picture. But this is just, um, you know, it just goes to show you how powerful this programming is, this, this Soviet style programming that's gotten into everybody. Yeah, one of the things uh, I'm connecting with is the distinction between truth and then morality. So we don't even do a really good job uh, being truthful ourselves and questioning things that we believe to be true, especially mainstream dominant narratives, which we just talked about quite a lot. But then the application of it to, is it moral? Is it um, reciprocal? There's some things that we've added. Uh, and when I say we, I'm talking like guys that have been in the propertarian circle have added to the moral uh, question. And where I'm coming across is that morality really applies to our uh, genetic family. So that's kind of the limit. When we start to define things, we also define the limits of them. And I'm saying that morality really just goes as far as our genetic family. When it goes beyond that, we actually have a different set of rules. And that's where the whole thing around diversity is going to come down in a crashing halt because the morality just doesn't apply and it doesn't apply equally. And then when you get into race realism and you look at these statistics even closer, you start to see that, whoa, blacks kill whites at 10 times the rate that whites kill blacks. I mean, that's just the numbers. When you look at rapes, uh, 20, or nearly 20,000 black men rape white women or white men, whatever, um, but white uh, victims. And the reverse white on black rape is zero. And it's been zero for like five years. So <laughs> diversity, the whole diversity of our, is our strength is one of those uh, new speak or double speak or double think type of things. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Sugar, you won't have seen the dictionary 10th edition yet, Smith. It's that thick. The 11th edition will be that thick. Well, the revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. The secret is to move from translation to direct thought to automatic response. No need for self-discipline. Language coming from here, not from here. Where they just keep pushing the absolute reverse. Whites in general are have the least in-group preference and are the least racist. And probably because this white guilt uh, and white... Uh, narratives of white privilege, white supremacy, all the narratives against to demoralize, destabilize, create conflict and try to normalize this. But the, but the point I want to leave with is that fundamentally the truth will win out. 
And what Eli opened with is to see how narratives, the reframing, the overloading, the techniques that are there, we want to share this with folks so that they get real sharp about seeing things for their propagandic purpose. And that part of the waking up, which it gets better, it gets easier, you start to connect dots, see patterns, and the truth will win out. So um, yeah, that's what we're here for. Well, you talked about limits. And usually this is couched as, you know, without limit. Diversity is our strength. It's just offered as a categorical, you know, without limit. Um, whenever you do that, pretty much you're lying. Uh, because it's quite probable that there are benefits to diversity. Um, you know, there are some that I can think of, like I love ethnic food. Uh, so that's a benefit to diversity. Now you could obtain that benefit by importing a very small amount of diversity and you would have enough diversity to prepare ethnic food for everybody, right? And then so for every increment of diversity further that you import, you're getting less and less compelling benefits, but you're getting more and more problems. I've heard a lot of talk about uh how good the Japanese businessmen are. Quite frankly, I'm sorry, I don't get it. I don't see it, I'm not impressed. Not one I order. You're fired. What? So uh, there's gonna be some point at which whatever benefits of diversity that you're tabulating are not going to be warranted by the costs that are associated with them. So you're gonna have diminishing marginal returns, you know, because the first, ideally, especially if you're doing it sensibly, the first diversity you bring in are going to be addressing, you know, maybe the most critical needs that you have or desires that you have for diversity to provide. Um, and then every additional unit of diversity after that is gonna be addressing less and less critical or less and less, um, you know, uh, necessary or helpful or, or demanded um, desires or needs. And so there's going to be diminishing marginal return on increased diversity. But the costs of diversity, on the other hand, may remain linear or even go up non-linearly as you continue to increase diversity. Uh, so there's going to be some point at which the, the benefits of diversity are no longer worth the cost. Now, where's that point? So when you just say diversity is our strength, you're not even addressing that question. Well, how much diversity is our strength? Under what circumstances? In what ways? For what reasons? If you don't address those questions that define the limits of your statement, you're just being misleading. You're just being deceptive. You're just being manipulative. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And to add on to that, um, a couple, three points. One, BuzzFeed is everywhere, uh, meaning when, when assuming they watch this video, they're going to hear these words like race realism and all these things, and they're going to activate, all their almonds are going to activate. They're going to run all over the place and say, look at this pack of racists. And you have to anticipate that attack because anything that stands against, you know, uh, the narrative here uh, is always bad, but there's much more than, than, than defending the narrative going on. There is limits, there is cost, there is money going on here. The, the benefit of, of, of this type of, uh, say, immigration or bringing in um, different cultures that otherwise would not play well together, um, that is done exclusively for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is cheap labor. That's it. Once you're able to reframe the entire argument that we're talking about here outside of these loaded BuzzFeed traps and talk exclusively in terms of this is cheap labor, now you can have a really uncomfortable conversation for these corporate paymasters by saying, hey, by the way, all this multiculturalism, that's a government subsidy. We're subsidizing your access to cheap labor. Now you turn this into a policy talk. Now you turn this into something that um, think tanks and everybody else can actually target once you reframe this into a cheap labor argument. So then what you're doing is you're taking those limits and those costs. Uh, it's not a question of do they go up linearly or do they go up or down? Um, I'm interested in exposing the hidden costs. 
the actual costs that are either passed down the line by destroying things like uh, certain types of unions and certain types of guilds and uh, bringing in cheap labor for the sake of uh, a 401k pension, a 401k or a pension fund or these type of things. Once you can start framing it in this way, you will find a lot of allies that you didn't have before. Well, that's right. And also the, um, you know, it's worth pointing out that the costs and the benefits don't accrue to the same people. So ethnic food, that's something we can all enjoy, but the cheap labor, that's mainly going to employers, a very, very narrow subset of the population. Also benefiting bigly landlords, um, landlords benefit tremendously. Everybody else pays higher mortgages or higher rents because the property values are going up. Um, so that's a redistribution of sorts. Then you have, um, you know, political externalities because most of these people, most immigrants from most sources, especially, you know, third world immigrants from non-Western countries uh, vote Democrat. So that's obviously a huge incentive to bring them in or to, uh, you know, give them a pathway to citizenship if they come in illegally or whatever. Yeah, it's a they're not just cheap labor, they're cheap votes. Yep. Yeah, that's the Why dual. Both? Yep. That's the dual side of this, uh, this dragon, this beast of the uh, the diversity immigration beast is uh, cheap labor and uh, cheap votes. And it's, um, it's amazing that people are they either don't know or they just are afraid to talk about the costs you know cost cost benefit analysis is something that we could really use on a lot of these topics but it's it's not being utilized it's just a a one-sided narrative that just keeps getting hammered down our throats on top of that they always they always steal the frame with the words that they use diversity of what they pick all the superficial diversity categories to separate everyone into and not diversity of action or diversity of thought or diversity of background, none of that. Just if you are diverse and you fit into our containers, you can come. That's not diversity. Yep. Yeah, well, it reminds me of um, just just the way the culture has become hyper-feminized, you know, um, because the, the feminine is going to examine something from the, uh, the emotional standpoint and to, you know, you, you bring people in from another culture and, you know, maybe it makes you feel good. It makes you feel nice because you're allowing them to benefit. Um, you're being compassionate, but the masculine side of things, the, the systemizing side of things where you analyze everything, um, in terms of costs and benefits as a whole, that's the perspective that's being left out. And I think it reflects a larger, uh, imbalance between the uh, symbolic masculine and feminine in the culture. Well, I think well, there's a speak to this some too that um they've weaponized white women and especially that empathetic outreach and that it's gone to the level of being psychotic um empathy <laughs> and it's it's hijacked so much um that they especially if you have the breakdown of family and they're not putting their effort into children well then they're going to try to have all the um other causes or their uh, proxy babies and the uh, things that they want to virtue signal for and their efforts. Um, that's a big challenge. And if you combine that with women that control what 80% of uh, personal household spending, um, then a lot of the consumptive money. So I, I like how we were able to expose that both votes and cheap labor and these externalities. And then, so how do you want to hijack this? Pat was looking into how um, basically the AIs try to find a consensus of what white women are nagging about or complaining about, and then they'll go after and kind of be uh, attack it, you know, wasp attack the whole thing. And um, I only bring that up because I do want to determine what's our best solution. We'd said earlier, possibly fighting the frame of it and to reframe the framing. Uh, I've said truth will win out. So there's something in there of a direction that we can go. And hopefully as we continue to share uh, better ideas and truthful stuff, we can you know, attack the insanity. I, I think the whole thing's gonna fall because it just, 
it takes too much time, money, energy, willing dupes, bad actors, um, propaganda to prop up this empire of lies. And it's getting exhausting. People are tired of it. And um, that's the direction I think it's going to go. Hi, can I help you? Yes, I'd like a ham and cheese omelet or wham fries. I'm sorry, we stopped serving breakfast, but we are on the lunch menu now. I want breakfast. Well, you can't have it. We're not serving it. <laughs> so you said. All right, if I may jump in here real quick. Uh, someone, someone said the magic words. Um, uh, yes, uh, it, circling back and realizing that the feminized tone is what is um, effectively the, the primary target of any type of agitation. You always want to target the females first. When you're trying to undermine a country or trying to undermine any type of opportunity, you always go for them first because they are force multipliers in a narrative space. Goodbye, David. If you control the mind of one female, you control at least 50 guys. And that number only goes up as females become more accessible via social media or via dating apps. There's always, from, from the ages of 14 and up, every woman can tell you the endless amounts of dudes who are trying to hit on them. So every female brain is a force multiplier in a narrative space. Now, um, there, someone was wise to recognize this at Google and decided to use female disgust, in particular, affluent white female urban liberal disgust, or awfuls, my personal favorite uh, adjective, <laughs> they uses their disgust to activate when things need to be censored. Now, why is that the case? I thought AIs were good. I thought they were going to be the Terminator and kill us all. Well, it turns out AIs are pretty stupid. And let me give you an example. Don't make me die. I'm David. I'm David. I'm David. Mecca don't plead for their lives. Who is that? He looks like a boy. Built like a boy to disarm us. This is a pen, right? So if I train my AI vision to see this pen, uh, you know, different, like different colors and different variations of it, if this pen appears in a photo, then the AI is going to say, yeah, I'm 80% certain that's a pen, right? Um, but that's not how I, my brain works. I look at that pen and I say, yeah, that's a pen. I'm not, I'm not 70% certain it's a pen and 30% confused that it might be a hot dog. And I, that my brain doesn't work like that, right? So AIs, um, AIs don't work like our brain. Now, going back to the example, if I train the AI to see this pen, if I just rotate the pen, guess what? The AI can't see it anymore. So if I zoom in, the AI can't see it anymore. If I zoom out, the AI can't see it anymore. AI is pretty stupid when it comes to this sort of stuff, right? So when it comes to censorship, when it comes to AI-driven censorship, it makes the same mistake. It makes the exact same mistake. And so what happens is a bunch of people get censored that shouldn't be censored. Now, Google doesn't want to do that because it ruins their narrative dominance. So what do they do instead? Well, they rely on humans to activate when the AIs kick off, when the censorship kicks off, because that's more reliable because the brains are actually doing the work. They're seeing the content. And as their disgust goes up, the AIs fire. And then stuff start getting flagged, and then you have a narrow corridor in which the AI censorship can take place. So you get that laser focus. You can actually scale and hit all the targets you want to hit. So my only function was to be someone she could use to escape. Yeah. And they've they've been doing this since 2013, since Gamergate. And I was inter I was like actively interfering with their research. I didn't even realize it at the time. Um, but uh, and to wrap this up because I don't want to dominate this too much. Um, the thing that I've noticed is, is that wonderful Karen meme. Oh, that Karen meme. Oh, that thing has been a blessing from God. So when, when, when the average demographic here sees that Karen meme, that, the, that awful group I was talking about, when they see that Karen meme, their disgust goes way down. They don't visualize, they don't, they don't externalize their disgust anymore. They actually feel shame. And that actually prevents the externalization of disgust. When that happens, those AIs don't fire. And when those AIs don't fire, there's no censorship going on, which means you create a window in which you can launch narrative attacks in to, that would traditionally be censored, but you get maximum effect and maximum spread for your attacks if you suppress the disgust factor of that demographic. I would ask if there's any way we can turn white women against Islam, but I wouldn't want to... Uh reinforce feminism in any way shape or form <laughs> there's a 
<clears throat> to circle back to the beginning of, of our talks about um, what the Native Americans, there's that white guilt, that shame, and that blocks that disgust sensitivity there. What I like about our position right now is that there's a there's a global pandemic scare that I bet raises everyone's disgust sensitivity a half a standard deviation to a standard deviation, given the, uh, the tie between uh, viral diseases and authoritarian attitudes. Yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to switch gears a little bit here, guys, and uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the Facebook posts, like we had mentioned earlier, uh, that have gone uh, not necessarily viral, but popular uh, amongst us. And um, Brandon, yours uh, that you had recently, you said, uh, never apologize to the mob. Do not offer an explanation. Addressing their concerns gives them credibility. There isn't any. And um, as we're talking about um, these narratives that have been going, uh, you know, have been across the culture for, for generations for, for a long time, um, they've given power to the mob that we've seen um, literally burn down cities now. So um, I wonder if you guys want to talk about, um, you know, what strategies that people might have uh, in addressing this mob other than, you know, the government doing what it should be doing, which is enforcing law and order. What can people do um, to to kind of get get over this, um, you know, this caving to the mob that our culture seems to be stuck in? Well, if it's an actual mob, meaning if you're being what swarmed, rallied against, or doxed, I stand by my advice. Keep your mouth shut. Uh, call in other people to stand in for your character because if someone defames your character for no reason, and then you defend that defamation, you give their, you give what they're saying credence in the first place by addressing it. So you're, what you're adopting their framework which put you on a bad footing if you're looking to solve the problem. Now, it's a, it's a behavior that circumvents violence. It's why herds mob or they stampede because they're not forthright about removing things they don't like. They need the others also not to like it, accept it and help them remove it. Uh, so the, the, the tactics that are, are used here they're to, they're to circumvent the expulsion of a negative externality as soon as that externality presents itself. The fastest way to deal with any problem is to get rid of it at its root as it pops up. And if you're not doing that, you're accruing, uh, you're accruing what I would call violent interest. You're just stacking that stuff up for later. Yeah. So just rejecting their, uh, just just rejecting their tactics is illegitimate out of hand instead of trying to go along with their game because you don't want to legitimize it in the first place. And there's, um by the time mobs and riots even show up, you're already late to the game. It takes 18 full-time dedicated steps before riots even form when you're trying to destabilize a civilization uh, or at least a city or, or a group or anything. So r riots are like, I don't know, step 15. So they're already 15 steps in. Um, the riots just don't appear magically, uh, and then they run around burning stuff. First, they have to get away with it, right? Because if, if you burn down stuff and people have no preparation for that whatsoever, they're going to react negatively. Well, what happens? Well, they burn down Portland, and what does everyone do? The entire population has been demoralized for the past 30 years, so they just sit there and take it. If you just drop the mob randomly on any type of country, I mean, there's more than enough YouTube videos and world star videos out there that, that shows exactly what happens under normal circumstances. Um, but this is, uh, if, if, if riots are already on your doorstep, you've already lost, you need to leave. Fifth Avenue, we have no force to send. The 16th Precinct, all the stores are closing on 8th Avenue. You need to get the hell out. Um, that's, that's your only option at this point, standing and, and resisting. You have to resist the other 14 steps beforehand too. Your only option is to leave at that point. Oh. Barnum's American Museum on fire. Animals are escaping. Animals are escaping. What, I mean, what's the long-term solution though? Cause like leaving, you know, retreating from the territory, uh, that's not, uh, that's not going to work in the long term. So what, um, how, how are people going to, I mean, there's, there's two different 
types of mob we're talking about here. The, there's the one mob, which is like the cultural narrative, which is like the social justice warriors, you know, the feminists, the uh, Anita Sarkeesians of the world, you know, that um, use all of their uh, GSRM, you know, they're gossiping, they're shaming, they're, they're ridiculing, rallying, manipulation to, um, to enforce the, the narrative um, online, in person, and otherwise. Um, but then there's also the actual physical mob that we're seeing now in the real world. So um, just wanted to distinguish those two things, but you can fight against, you can fight against both of them. Uh, I like, I'm with Pat, where if, if you're in a city and there are people rioting and burning buildings, and that's the type of lawlessness that's allowed around you, you're in a bad spot and you should move. Uh, but to what we were saying a little bit earlier, it's the mobbing and rallying tactics that legitimize riots and mobs in the real. If you're allowed to mob people in the abstract, they're going to allow for the same tap uh, tactics in the physical. It lines directly up with how it is they would forcefully change something for their liking. So as, as we... As we disassemble their ability to pick and pry pieces of packs away, because that's what they do, they target one of us, it delegitimizes the pack that you belong to, and it also proves as a warning to other people in other packs that people can be removed and what uh, punished at, at the mob's will. Those things have to become disallowed, and they're becoming that way. You just had a kid do it. So it's not to say that it's beyond the pale. It's coming. These people are going to stand up. Everyone likes to point this, uh, what the, the violent rhetoric into our corner. And most of the people who work in our groups are what observational scientists. We're telling you that the agents in this world are under a set of constraints that is so uh, it's so daunting to them that they're going to start fighting the constraints off. There's no other way. The New Zealand shooting months back, that was one of your first warnings. That wasn't an irrational actor. That was a rational actor removing what he thought were threats from his land. That That is something that's temperamental. It's not an extremist. It's not some extreme temperament. It's just a conservative temperament. Yeah, it... So, it, it, it that that situation in particular brandon um is is interesting i mean tragic but it it it's um it's interesting because the the media and the the mainstream frame um through which the culture views all these events um it completely failed to analyze that situation um like you're saying like a scientist like we try to do um and so you know the root cause of that event uh, was never found out like all these people who are complaining about the bloodshed or you know they're confused they're crying they're just you, you know they're doing their gsrm like they usually do um but they they never get to the root cause they never identify why somebody might have done that in the first place instead it's like okay let's censor everything let's censor this guy's manifesto like let it's it's just piling more problems on top of the existing problem you're just making it worse you're not addressing the root cause you can tie it right back in to the diversity is our strength thing. It's like, yeah, it's a lot of people's strength because the more diverse you are, the more you atomize and then you become level on, on a playing field. Everyone's the same, but they're the same in destitution, not in like kind. I mean, you're only driving the place to the bottom. Least common diversity. denominator. Yeah, well, diversity is everyone's strength except those who collect and cooperate and white women it's literally not their strength they're too what submissive and and uh, welcoming for their own good tolerant most of it is done by americans to americans thanks to lack of moral standards as i mentioned before uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore a person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information the facts tell nothing to him. And then on top of that, all their narratives tell them to be more that way. And that's the last thing we need from them, unless it's to your direct in-group. You don't need your help otherwise. You don't need your care elsewhere. There's enough of us to care for. So 
know. People aren't looking at it right. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, tolerance is really it's it's um the the, the intolerance of any counter to the tolerance narrative. Uh, it's really just submission. That's that's the way I see tolerance. Like it, you're just submitting to uh, uh, the demand for a certain narrative. So there's really no way to have this ultimate tolerance utopia. It's 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 uh, contradictory. Well, um, Kurt Godel, when he was doing his citizenship application for the United States, he was an Austrian logician. And um, that's what he couldn't wrap his head around. He's like, if you're tolerant of intolerance, won't you just end up with intolerance? And uh, Einstein had to like, tell him to shut up and just go get with the program and stop asking so many questions or he wouldn't get a citizenship. Um, but that's, uh, you know, a basic contradiction that's built into liberalism and, and many things that are descended from liberalism. They aren't very liberal today, but uh, it's built right in. Now you asked about long-term strategy a little while ago and um you know, one bright spot is conservatives or people with a conservative orientation or disposition in our society still have above replacement level fertility. Some groups um, like the Mormons are considerably, considerably above and some other groups like, you know, the Amish or the Hutterites are even, you know, way above that. But on the other hand, um, liberals and progressives and left wingers way below replacement level fertility. So the long-term strategy, you know, if we can just hang on for a generation or two, a lot of these problems sort themselves out. The problem is the damage that can be done in the meantime. So, um, you know, we need to focus on surviving that and coming through that. All right. And also helping conservatives not to suck. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me, um, Eli, there's a book by a guy named Dr. Steve Turley. It's called The Return of Christendom, uh, Demography, Politics, and the Coming Christian Majority. Um, and I read this book last year, and in the book he, he argues essentially that uh, basically what you just said, because of the demographic uh, trends and the, uh, the difference between liberals and uh, Christian conservatives in terms of birth rates, that uh, liberals are essentially going to breed themselves out of existence in a generation or two, at least in, in a sense that they're, they're going to become culturally Ill irrelevant. In addition to that, um, not only do they refuse to breed uh, that particular mindset, but they abort, I don't know, anywhere between two to three potential of their children in a, in a single lifetime. So you're looking at, you know, massive, but what do they end up doing is they, in the 1990s, that was an argument in, in the upper halls of academia between Europe and America, where they were looking at Italy and they were looking at Japan and they were saying, oh, replacement, replacement, the rates, they're going low, fertility's low, we need to do something, which was actually a Trojan horse to bring in very cheap labor once again. So it, it, we can turn around and say like, ah, oh, well, the problem will take care of itself. No, <laughs> the problem doesn't take care of itself. You, uh, you, have, you cannot take a passive uh, interpretation of these things. Uh, the opposition is clever and resourced and has many ways to play in this dojo and keep rolling with the punches. So you have to get on the mat with them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the in the meantime bit is the kicker, right? Because there's a lot of damage they can do before they pass out of existence naturally. And that's why historically um, the way to deal with people like this has been rather severe. You know, in the Albigensian crusade, the Catholic church de declared a crusade against the um, Cathars or Albigensians. They called themselves Bonhomme, which means good men in French. So, you know, they were virtue signalers and um, they believed in pacifism and vegetarianism and not, uh, serving in the military. They were anti-natalist. They were, uh, they advocated sodomy as a form of birth control. Um, so really very progressive for the 12th century. If you think about it, there's not a whole lot distinguishing them from these sorts that we have now. And it took off. It was going viral, spreading mimetically, right? And so 
obviously something like that is going to die out eventually. We don't have many shakers around. We don't have many Scopsy around. I'm talking about the uh, celibate sect and the, the sect that practiced uh, castration. So the, those kind of beliefs don't persist. And all progressive beliefs are of that nature, more or less, um, even if there's infinite variation in particulars. But they can do a lot of damage as they spread through a population mimetically um, in the meantime, in the short term. So, you know, what the Catholics did was they declared a crusade against them and they wiped them out and they were pacifists. So there was really no, uh, you know, great difficulty to it. So, I mean. Yeah. And, Go ahead. and also in terms of long-term strategy, um, it's worth exploring the psychology of these kinds of peoples, whether they are artifacts of civilization, which I suspect they might be, because these type of things date all the way back to Rome, even before Christendom, uh, where you had the cult of uh, Sybil, for example, um, where some Asia Minor god somehow infected the roman empire and it was this pop cult basically where dudes would dress up in dresses and cut off their wieners and beg for money it was like wildly popular and the only way the romans could deal with this problem uh as it spread and spread and spread was to say all right listen if you if you cut off your your ding dong then um uh, you're no longer a roman citizen right that that was their solution to that problem so th these type of things happen uh, in the pre-christendom and the post-christendom period um, and I, I suspect that it's an artifact of, of, of some kind of, I wouldn't say corruption, but definitely where uh, the one size fits all style of rule kind of doesn't work anymore, especially if you look at uh, um, the, the might of the, of the Catholic Church regarding the, the previous uh, conversation we were just having with Eli. So it's important to understand the psychology of these people without becoming one of them, if that makes sense. Uh, empathy can be your most powerful weapon in this fight, as long as you don't succumb to it. As long as you can understand why they think the way they think, as long as you can understand who they're willing to associate with and engage in their arguments, not in good faith or bad faith, but almost from a scientific analysis standpoint, and then allowing yourself to walk in their shoes just long enough to say, oh, that's how these people are formed. Now you have a point of reference where you can start dismantling how they think at the emotional level, not the logic level, not the, not the math level, but at the, at the heart string level. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend that approach uh, when, when dealing with this, because the, uh, if you do this conflict type of thing with them, there's a time and place for it, for sure. Um, little doses here and there, but, but um, if you do that, what they do is they run to the media and they say, I am a victim and they do the martyrdom thing. And all of, all of the white women run in and say, oh, this poor victim. Now, this was very true in the 1950s because at that time, middle-class white women were just in front of TVs all day taking care of their, house, uh, their houses and their kids. They didn't have full-time jobs and all these things. So TV was actively poisoning their minds and radio was doing the same thing. And they were just this sitting rich target for narrative warfare. And, we've, and, they've, been, and they've been using uh, that, guide, that, that goalpost ever since in terms of trying to play that victim narrative up and up and up. So if you can empathize with them just enough to understand how they think, um, uh, you, can, you can find yourself in a really good position uh, on, the, on the offensive. You will be all right. There, there. It's a really good point, uh, Pat. I, you know, it's, it's interesting for me because the, the uh, empathy thing, I always hear um, liberals and progressives talking about, you know, empathy, compassion, and uh, those two things aren't the same but that's what they focus on. And, um, you know, for me, I've noticed with myself, like the, the empathy thing is, is useful, but it's hard for me sometimes to empathize with the left because they just end up triggering my disgust mechanism so quickly that I just, you know, it, that's difficult. But I think what you said there is good. Uh, it, it actually is a tool that we should be using and, and try at least as far as we can to, uh, as far as it's useful, um, you know, we need to use it. So, um, I'll take note of that personally. Empathy is a terrible system at scale. It might be great in certain circumstances. You know, it's useful for an individual in trying to understand where other people are coming from. It's useful for a mother in taking care of her family. Um, it's useful within a, 
close knit community, right? But as far as building institutions at social scale, it's a terrible system because it's so susceptible to, um, you know, malicious or, or insincere appeals to empathy. Um, it really, all this sharing and caring stuff, it sounds great and it has its place. It definitely, there are domains in which it's the correct approach, but um, it's super, super susceptible to free riding. And that's why we do stuff like markets instead, where there is like an accurate and complete accounting. There's a, you know, a quid pro quo, there's an enforced reciprocity um, built into, let's say, markets that doesn't exist with like these altruistic um, mentalities of caring and sharing. And from each according to his uh, ability to each according to his need, those kind of socialist sentiments are really kind of out of place at the scale of a whole society. They don't scale to that level. Um, now that point's been made over and over again before. Um, and it doesn't seem to have any effect on the type of people who have that mentality, but it is worth emphasizing for the kind of people who can see through it. Yeah, that type of mentality, they see a nation as a charity not as a thriving civilization. It's something we need to, to, to export to everyone. And why can't, why can't everyone be as happy as I am? It's coming from actually pretty sincere places at the individual level. Um, but that sincerity gets exploited and turns them into a foot soldier. Yep. Yeah, so I guess for the audience, um, utilize empathy, um, but, don't, um, but be careful to uh, look out for situations where people can take advantage of that. And... and you know, you can adopt the altruistic mindset or the empathetic mindset um, for a little while, but uh, don't don't allow people to uh, to take advantage of you while you're doing it. That's that's the danger of it, and that's I think that's well, the left. They they just do this all the time. The the individual um, liberals, like you're talking about, Pat, they'll you know they'll be so compassionate that they they become blind to um, to malicious activity essentially. Well, all I would add in here, it perfectly lines up with the left making critique, harping, criticism, slander, demanding solutions, but not providing solutions, and especially not providing fully accounted solutions. So they're so far removed from maybe the autistic right, which is systematic, and we want to go through all these processes so that we give them solutions. If you boil it down just to simple relationships, they say sometimes, oh, women just want to be heard. They don't want you to give them solutions. Okay, but as we're just listening to women, Western civilization is being destroyed and it's being destroyed purposefully, okay? So on our side, we want, we want to, why aren't our solutions being heard? What, you know, and or if you don't want to hear our solutions, what are your solutions? And if you're just going to give me what has been canned and programmed for you, that's not going to work. At least it should be open for critique, our critique of that solution that's being offered. But this is what the game is, you know, is just to make demands of us to take action that men take action so they can critique that action. It's insanity and it has to stop. That's why Pat's been going on that if you can call out the Karens, if you can continue to call out the insanity, you at least get them to stop developing some bullshit consensus on their next empathetic uh um you know i'm <laughs> i don't want to say holocaust but their next empathetic you know mega victim whatever their mega you know crusade is i guess and um there's a way to to combat it i guess and that's what we're looking for it's worse it's worse than that because they're they're rallying around specific inaction it's not even action anymore I want you to sit and do nothing. Wait, well, until either, someone else, wait until someone else solves it. Yeah, well, it's either that or just uh, the mob ends up solving it, which they don't solve anything. They just create more problems, of course. Um, yeah, it, the whole, um, you know, the women, you know, just uh, wanting men to listen to them instead of offering a solution. Yeah, that's uh, it's an interesting conundrum. I mean... It, Female psychology, man, it's uh, it's a hell of a thing. So, 
Well, we are coming up on around an hour here, guys. Um, Brian, is there anything else that we wanted to uh, to kind of touch on before we wrap up today? Um, I, I think I'll add a final note. One of my favorite charts is true affect and true cognition versus false affect and false cognition. And this is the one of people that have true affect and true cognition are normal people. People that have false affect and false cognition are psychopaths. And then you can have varying shades within there. And we can also have our old self that may have been more programmed and we can have our newer present self that is more informed and has truer cognition and truer affect. Um, I, w I want to uh, just encourage that what we're trying to do here is to give more <laughs> true cognition and true affect and we will have less patience for false affect and false cognition and it will be reciprocal i mean if you come in like a a, a crazed cat lady with you know a full wine box uh down we have zero sympathy or empathy for that but if somebody you know it has to be met in good faith don't meet us with a mob unless you expect us to match you with a mob or <laughs> the ways that we handle things too. So that's, I don't care if we go longer. I, I think an hour is pretty digestible for people. And this was a really great opening. Uh, I don't know how it snuck up on us, but Eli, that was a wonderful opening, almost monologue, but it, it set a great course. I thank you for that. If you want to do a historical opening next time, cold open, you can do it. <laughs> Uh, cause obviously towards the end of this, I think we've covered a lot of ground and I would hope that the good dudes that watch this got a lot out of it. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, cool. On that note, thanks everybody for uh, participating. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the good dude show and we will catch you next time.